Thank you, David. I'm glad to be here. Uh, while this is a, <clears throat> an update talk and not a debate talk, I hope next year that management of cystic neoplasms of the pancreas hopefully will be a debate because hopefully I'll show you in the next 10 or 15 minutes that this certainly is an area of controversy regarding the management. And it's something we're seeing more of of late. If you look at this increasingly common dilemma, it may not be necessarily seen by medical oncologists, but by the, by the clinicians, by those, even if you're imaging patients for surveillance for other malignancies, this is a common scenario that many of us see. In fact, if you look at pancreatic cysts are being diagnosed with increasing frequency, data suggests 2.3% uh, of CT scans done routinely have a cyst in the pancreas. Other studies suggest from 2.4 to 13% found on routine MRI scans. So more and more a common problem. Clinicians don't know what to do with these things, and I must say surgeons also uh, don't know what to do with these. Part of the problem is there's a spectrum. We don't, it's difficult to know what the cyst is. Is it malignant, is it pre-malignant, or is it a completely benign lesion? And also, what is the risk of malignancy in these pre-malignant lesions such as IPMN? So, and it's not like removing polyps in the colon that are pre-malignant or even maybe benign. The morbidity of surgical removal of cysts in the pancreas is not inconsequential. So that is a twist or a, or a complication. And then, of course, do we observe or do we operate and what is the risk of observation? So we'll try to touch on at least a little bit some of these issues. Not an uncommon problem. So we see this is just a routine scan, a cystic lesion. This is in the head of the pancreas. How do we manage this? Uh, and we'll t try to touch on some of those issues. So when one, one thinks about the classification of pancreatic cysts, one can think of them as ones without malignant potential, pre-malignant or those with malignant potential, and, and malignancies are, are occasionally cystic. If you look at uh, malignant tumors, even adenocarcinoma can be cystic. Neuroendocrine tumors, about 10 or 15 percent, are cystic in appearance of peanuts, and then there are some other solid pseudopapillary uh, and other rare conditions, acinar malignancies, that can have a cystic manifestation. The pre-malignant uh, pre or malignant potential, we'll talk about the most common, is the IPMN, interductal papillary mucinous neoplasm, but there are others, mucinous cystic neoplasms and other tubular carcinomas, if you will. And then there's a significant number of completely non-malignant cysts, the most common, of course, being a pseudocyst, and sometimes this can be a challenge to differentiate, Lympho, lymphoepithelial cysts, retention cysts, others, as well as a serous cystic adenoma, which is, uh, can mimic the mucinous form, but have very low, if not any, malignant potential. So when one thinks about classifying cysts, I think one way to think about it are the look at uh, cysts can be either non-neoplastic, most common being pseudocysts, and of the neoplastic varieties, there can be cystic degeneration of neoplasms, and we'll talk about serous tumors, which have very low to no malignant potential, and mucinous neoplasms, which have a pre-malignant potential. And as I mentioned, the classification of such cysts, the history and demographics are important because they can vary depending on the age and gender, and certainly history of pancreatitis, uh, particularly if one has imaging studies before and after, can help elucidate. Keep in mind, though, sometimes pancreatitis can be, uh, can be the result of a, cyst, of a neoplastic cyst or even a malignancy in the pancreas. So one, cannot, one needs to be careful about always assuming that if someone has a history of pancreatitis, then that naturally must be a pseudocyst. It's not always the case. We'll talk about imaging, which is very important, and analysis of the fluid, typically with EUS assessment, and fluid uh, sampling can sometimes help us not definitively, but can sometimes help us in determining what these lesions are. So first, just an overview of the classification. If you look at the malignancies, this entity, the pseudo solid pseudopapillary cystic neoplasm, rare tumor, but often uh, in the differential, also called the Franz or the Hamoudi tumor, uncommon, only about 800 uh, total cases, common in young females. It has this classic solid cystic, large central calcification. It's a famous, it's a common thing to, to grill a medical student on, but you don't really see this that often. 
What, if one does aspirate it, the fluid uh, characteristics are serous in nature, low CEA, low amylase, and there are some cellular characteristics that may help us characterize what these Hamoudi tumors are. They do have a malignant potential, and typically, if when the diagnosis or considers this, then this is a tumor that typically needs to be resected. Often these can be quite large tumor, again, more common in younger women, but still very rare. I mentioned neuroendocrine, pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors occasionally can be cystic, about 10 to 15 percent. And they, they typically have an appearance with this arterial rim enhancement that's a little distinct from IPMN or others, but sometimes it can be confusing. There's typically no communication with a pancreatic duct. They can be focal and have other features consistent with neuroendocrine tumors. But if one does aspirate it, it's typically serous in nature, low CEA. Obviously, these are either malig these are malignancies, actually, and the management of small pancreatic, cystic or non-cystic pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors are somewhat controversial, the very small ones, although typically we do recommend surgical resection of pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, if indeed this is what it's suspected. What about serous tumors? The serous cyst adenoma is probably the one lesion because it's common and it can mimic mucinous tumors that often can be the, the most difficult diagnostic and management challenge. That is, if we can rule, it, rule out or rule in this, this entity, then often one can determine whether to operate, for example, or not. It makes up about 10 or 15 percent of all cystic neoplasms, more common in women in their 50, or 50s or 60s. Most are in the head of the pancreas, most are asymptomatic, often found. This is, of course, a large symptomatic one. This appearance is not always typical on a scan, but this kind of microcystic honeycomb-type lo lo uh, uh, lobulations, loculations are the typical appearance of a serous cyst adenoma. Again, smaller ones, though, don't have this classic uh, radiologic appearance. No communication with a duct. They're often lined by simpler cuboidal epithelium and serous fluid. But again, sometimes it can be challenging with a cyst aspiration on EUS to really determine whether it's mucinous or, or cystic. But if indeed, a mucinous or serous, but if indeed this is suspected, very low malignant potential, and typical recommendation is to leave them alone unless they're symptomatic. What about the mucinous tumors? These are the more common ones, and these are the ones that have malignant potential. Two categories, the, the MCNs, or the mucinous cystic neoplasms, less common, and the IPMN, something we're seeing more frequently. And these, we think of this as, if you look at the typical adi ductal adenocarcinoma of the pancreas, mo if one thinks about the carcinogenesis of this malig common malignancy, most go through a typical pathway that probably with premalignant lesions are the panin lesions. But there's a subset of adenocarcinoma, we think, that arise from these premalignant cystic neoplasms, IPMN and MCN. And so this is at least one opportunity to have some optimism in the, in the prevention, if you will, of, of adenocarcinoma of the pancreas, is to identify at least this small subset of premalignant lesions, and at least that we can hopefully address. But part of the problem is we can overtreat by being overly aggressive about removing those that may not always have the malignant, uh, the chance of becoming malignant. So the mucinous or the MCN, again, relatively uncommon, more common in middle-aged women. Uh, imaging characteristics are this macrocystic, unifocal, well demarcated, more common in the body and tail. And it's mucin if aspirated, high CEA, which is indicative of mucin, low amylase. And the classic feature is this ovarian type stroma that's identified both on histology, but also on occasion can be identified on cyst aspiration. It does have a malignant potential, and typically recommendation is to resect these, these tumors if this is what's suspected. IPMN, as I mentioned, we're seeing this more frequently. Is the incidence going up, or is it actually that we're just because of imaging? It's probably the latter. They're relatively common, both in men and women. It tends to increase with age. Im imaging characteristics are, t are, as we'll talk about, depends if it's a so-called main duct or branch duct type. This is an image of a main duct IPMN, where the, there's a general dilatation of the entire pancreatic duct, as opposed to a, a, branch, a side branch or branch duct IPMN, where it appears as a typical cyst in the pancreas, either the head or the, or the body or tail. 
high, typically showing mucin, high CEA, high amylase, often in communication with the pancreatic duct, even the side branch. These do have a variable, but do have a malignant potential. And we'll touch on the really another challenge clinically, when should these be removed or not? So when one thinks about IPM, as I mentioned, the main duct is a less common, but it de defined by an enlargement of the entire pancreatic duct, typically. Uh, defined as depending on, on nine millimeter or 10 millimeters uh, is an is a indica indication of a higher risk main duct IPMN. A branch duct IPMN is a cystic lesion. This is in the uncinate, but it can be anywhere in the pancreas. And there's a third variety, which is called so-called the mixed IPMN, which is a combination of a main duct and branch duct uh, variety in the same patient. What about the evaluation of cysts of the pancreas? Well, the mainstay is the cross-sectional imaging, either CT or MRI scan, and it's a little bit controversial as to which is the best imaging modality. Here I've outlined some of the advantages and disadvantages, both for, for surveillance as well as for detection. But there's some advantages. MRI is probably most sensitive at determining whether there's a solid component or some high-risk features in an IPMN. So I think it's imperative that a high-quality pancreas protocol cross-sectional imaging be done to carefully evaluate the characteristics of a cyst in the pancreas, as well as determining if it may be multiple or multifocal. And so we typically, in our center, we typically use MRI scan, both for surveillance but also for evaluation of the pancreas, but it's somewhat institution-dependent. The other mainstay of evaluation of most, probably not all, cystic neoplasm, cystic lesions of the pancreas is EUS, endoscopic ultrasound uh, with assessment by ultrasound, you typically transgastrically to evaluate the characteristics of the cyst. It's accurate at defining these characteristics and, is, of course, it's typically coupled with cyst aspiration, imp an important part, as I've suggested, to determine the characteristics, the mucin, the CEA, amylase level. Uh, it is more invasive, sometimes can be uh, difficult to do, contaminated with uh, enteral contents that can sometimes confuse it. But with a high quality uh, gastroenterologist typically that's good at this technique, it really adds to the multidisciplinary team that helps to evaluate carefully um, cystic neoplasms of the pancreas. This is an example of an EUS with a mural nodule. This is pretty obvious, but sometimes they can be fairly subtle. This is a high-risk feature of an IPMN that mandates surgical therapy. And there are different ways that I mentioned. The fluid analysis, cyst aspiration is important. It's helpful in differentiating serous versus mucinous. It can uh, sometimes help with a CEA level, and we'll talk about there's some early studies suggesting that, that, that the genetic analysis of the fluid or the cyst wall may be helpful at differentiating these. There are some limitations, as I mentioned, operator dependent can have some false positives or negatives in the cyst aspiration. FNA or core biopsies are rarely done for these, but can add some additional cellular, some additional histologic evaluation. But again, it's somewhat challenging to perform core biopsies um, of the wall, if you will, of these lesions. So as I mentioned, the mutational analysis, this is a study, these are data particularly from Johns Hopkins looking at in resected specimens. So it really is a little bit more of a challenging to get a small amount of fluid and then assessing the genetic analysis, but in, at least in studies looking at the entire resected specimen and analyzing the cyst fluid for mutational analysis, there can be some signals of mutational analysis that can help steer us into helping determine both the etiology of the cyst, particularly those that may be pre-malignant and need resection, versus some that may not need surgical therapy for example, the serous cyst adenomas. So sometimes it may be in the future that a molecular analysis of the cyst fluid can aid us in both differentiating the, uh, those that need to be resected or not, or perhaps even identifying among the mucinous ones which either are, are already malignant or may be at a higher risk for malignant potential. Because as we'll talk about, trying to determine which of the mucinous tumors, in particular which of the IPMNs need to be removed, is often in itself challenging. When one looks at the guidelines, this is the international consensus guidelines for the management of IPMN, and I won't take you through it all in detail. 
except that when an IPMN is suspected or diagnosed, not all of them need to be removed. There's some morbidity to surgically resecting all IPMNs, so there's a subset of these lesions that, need, that we generally recommend removal. And you can see here that if, if there are some features on cross-sectional imaging that are concerning di uh, an enlarged main duct, enhancing component on cross-sectional imaging, obstructive jaundice, those patients are operated on. If those features are not there, but on EUS or cyst aspiration, there are some additional features that then may prompt surgical resection. So there are some, some subset of, of IPMN in which surgical therapy is done. And I must say, parenthetically, we're probably currently operating on too many IPMNs uh, overall in, in, because of a fear that they may be, uh, become malignant. If you look at this as another international consensus, the so-called Sendai criteria, the similar group, when are the indications for surgery? Main duct IPMNs greater than one centimeter in diameter, generally the recommendation is all of those need to be resected. But here the kind of the challenge is the general of the surgical therapy is typically removing of the head of the pancreas, pancreatic duodenectomy. So it makes it's a little bit inconsistent to leave a component of dilated duct in this patient that arguably has a field defect. But if you look at the malignant risk in the main duct IPMN, the majority is in the head of the pancreas. So typically a total pancreatectomy is typically not recommended in most cases unless there's dysplasia on, at, at surgery at the time within the main duct. In contrast, branch duct IPMN, I would say the majority of these, the recommendation is not to remove them but specifically only those with high-risk features, obviously symptomatic ones, ones that are growing in size, so surveillance of small ones. If they're growing, we typically recommend removal. If there's evidence of a mural nodule or, nodule or solid component, typically those because of the higher risk of having a malignancy. And somewhat more controversial is the size, so le but generally the recommendation is IPMNs greater than three centimeters in size should be removed although still the, malign the risk of malignancy, at least at the time of resection in those over three centimeters is still relatively small. So just, in, so just some examples, this is a 62-year-old woman, no history of pancreatitis, incidental finding, cystic lesion in the tail of the pancreas. This was an, an MCN in this patient. So the cyst fluid showed, high, uh, showed mucin, high CEA and low amylase, non-dilated duct. This is although not necessarily obvious on imaging, this was a mucinous cystic neoplasm. This was resected with a laparoscopic distal, um, distal pancreatectomy. One controversy, by the way, surgically is, does, does a splenectomy need to be done with these? Sometimes we try to do a so-called spleen-preserving distal pancreatectomy. Sometimes the spleen is removed in conjunction with these procedures. 66-year-old male, this is an IPMN, you can see here in the neck of the pancreas. Again, these are the features, uh, mildly dilated pancreatic duct, cyst fluid, and so forth, demonstrating this finding. Here's another example of an IPMN in the body of the pancreas, small lesion, cyst fluid shows a similar findings. So just some examples of the typical findings we may find in these patients. So in summary, as I mentioned, cysts are being identified with increasing frequency. It's bec becoming increasingly a dilemma in how we manage these. There have been significant advances in imaging and EUS and cyst fluid, but still there are a lot of uh, 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 concerns or how one manages these. Currently, mucinous neoplasms, as I mentioned, these guidelines suggest selected cases in which these need to be operated on, but I would argue we're probably operating on too many and probably not operating on, on or identifying some which we may have been preventing a malignancy. I think one important thing is that cysts probably do, uh, cyst patients with cysts probably do benefit from a multidisciplinary team approach rather than manage the, managing these patients vertically. So I would encourage your centers to Think about a multidisciplinary team for, the, for a standardized approach with gastroenterologists, pancreatic surgeons, radiologists, cytopathologists, and so forth in order to really optimize the care of these patients. I thank you very much for your time.